So my name is David Kottelhuber. I am from New Zealand. I live in Austria. I work for a company that's based in New Zealand and started by an Austrian. Um, we get distributed systems from the ground up. Uh, and I have no speaking notes here. that talks to your VM, 
Um, the group leader could be the e-script if it's running in distributed mode, or it could be the VM itself. If there's no group leader, there's no place for I.O. to go. Now, the cool thing about this is that our RapidMQ system is still working. It's handling jobs, um, but we have no logs, which means we don't really know what fails. Um, so we start off going, where, where do we call the group leader of this code? Is there anything explicit in RapidMQ when we call this out? And, uh, and what does it do? And um, it turns out it handles logging. So the first key tip was there are no logs. Where do we handle logging? And then I logged onto the, the VM directly with a remote shell and just thought I'll just run a list of processes. You can do this with um, I bracket bracket dot. And um, sure enough, there was no group leader. Uh, I tried starting one. Uh, that, that didn't work very well. So we ended up restarting the whole um, random queue. And everything worked perfectly after that. It turns out this error is not particularly common. Um, there's one other person that has noted this on the internet until yesterday. It turns out there's a third person now who had this problem yesterday. I was in the IRC channel and I was so stoked to be able to get this person a reply instantly to say, this is your problem, this is what you need to do to fix it, this is why it happened. It's when you run out of disk space. So in our migration, we had to be doing the usual thing of replicating <coughs> data from one server to another. Um, databases were building indexes and one of the databases couldn't connect to its replication partner, so it was logging every you know, sort of few seconds, I can't talk to the other system, I can't talk to the other system, for about a week while we were setting things up. We hadn't hooked into our main logging system, so we didn't see these. It ran out of disk space, um, the sysadmin deleted the logs, fixed the problem, and never thought that it might impact other processes, which seems reasonable, they were working. And inside <coughs> RAPQ, the logging, um, Function effectively was broken. The supervisor um, had had this happen so often that it had crashed right up to the top, but it hadn't restarted the VM itself. And so this is really the key point for this talk: is would this work for your applications? I can be sh pretty sure until I had this incident, um, I tested my stuff and no, when I ran out of disk space, my my software was toast. Yep. So it's a good point to learn. How can we design our OTP applications in a way where we can sit there, that classic internet meme? I'm fine, the room's burning, how can you do that? If you'd asked me four or five years ago, I'd have no idea where to start. And for me, this is the, the key frustration with the Erlang ecosystem, is you come for the syntax, I love the Erlang syntax, I love the Elixir macros, and then there's this massive, massive leap of faith. How do I get from here to understanding this OTP thing? And there's this hill you climb up, it might take you two or three years, and you come down the side and you go, I don't understand why people find this so difficult. It's just obvious. And hopefully at the end of this talk, I'll give you some ideas how to attack the hill systematically as opposed to wandering around the base uh, for four years like I did. So, here we go, off we go. Um, the first, there's the actual theory, so there right at the top. The first thing I'd like to point out for running early production is basic OS monitoring is vital. If you don't do this, get it set up. It's really simple, um, logging, apart from when it bites you in the bar, bites you in the back. Um, basic OS logging, CPU, disk, processing, that sort of stuff. Network throughputs, network errors. It should take a couple of days to set up. If you don't have that, get that done. The second key learning from this is what are we prepared to sacrifice to keep your system going? Um, my background is starting from early with Apache CouchDB and databases. <coughs> primarily are a way of saying, if you give me this thing, I guarantee you will be back later. I guarantee it. And so in the couch to be where we're running out of disk space means you stop the system. You can't accept more data because you've got nowhere to put it. For Rabbit and Q, the semantics are different. We would rather keep sending messages out to someone else and hope that the rate of incoming messages uh, combined with our durable queues uh, means we can get away with that. So there's some semantics you can trade off. And the other key learning for me was <laughs> One experience in production. Yeah. Once you use more than fifty percent of your disk in CouchDB, you're screwed. Because, because you can't compact. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's the same with Postgres for vacuuming and probably any other database that has an append only log. Yeah. Uh, unless you're sharding. If you're sharding, you can get away with this. But that's a good point. Um, the other key learning for me was loosely coupled systems fail gracefully uh, if you do that. Um, the world is moving towards microservices that introduces latency and network partitioning as well. Um, but at least if your services are reasonably well defined, um, then you can have them fail separately and gracefully and not catastrophically. 
So designing open systems, this is my four um, tips or guidelines for how to, how to climb the OTP hill uh, without wandering over the base. <coughs> First um, concept is a thing called the error kernel. We're going to talk a little bit about state machines, finite state machines mainly. Um, queues is a way to put something where, put something somewhere to do later, and um, predictable modes of fail, which I'll explain later on. So the uh, error kernel is the minimal acceptable state we could uh, recover from. If you think of this in terms of people, um, if the world has been destroyed and a, and, a, and a plague unleashed um, in times gone past, we only need two people to restart the human race. In theory, it's probably the practice is a little more complicated, but that's our error kernel for people, just two people. Yep. Um, if you're having a pacemaker in your heart, um, I'm not an expert on pacemakers, so don't take this as medical advice, but I'm guessing the time of the last pulse is the only thing that really matters. So the pacemaker has some trouble, it crashes, and it restarts, the only thing it needs to know is when do I send the next pulse, can I get them regularly, and then it should be okay. Um, something I'm a little more familiar with, familiar with, with BitTorrent, um, there are only two things I need to know. I need to know the root hash, the unique hash that identifies that swarm, and any peer that is actually active. So everything else in my system can crash, I can lose all the data on the disk, uh, all of that can go, so long as I have one peer to talk to and the root hash, I can recover that state. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you can imagine the complexity of, uh, of, a, of a torrent system uh, man managing many, many different nodes, many networking connections. It turns out I need about probably like 60, 70 bytes to store enough state of the system to recover it from scratch. Not necessarily gracefully, not necessarily quickly, but to recover it. That's our very kernel. Um, I'm not really expert on space travel either, but I thought of a lunar module coming down to land, um, and I know that they had problems um, with the very first one um, um, in terms of processes crashing and um, CPU overload. I'm kind of guessing that so long as you know how high off the ground you are and your vector, so which direction you're heading and how fast, you can probably recover most of the other information, like how long have I got before I hit the ground uh, in time. And um, the point I want to make here is that the error kernel can be very, very, very small. This is the part of our application that matters the most. It's the piece you would consider saying, I put it in a database, I replicate that to another server, um, maybe I checkpoint it and put it in some external log file or, or a cloud service for safekeeping. That's the piece we want to preserve. Um, and once we've decided that, we can start, look at, start looking at what is acceptable to lose, what we can sacrifice. And remember, Zombie Rabbit says make sure your infrastructure is loosely coupled because it avoids cascading failure. So that's really the key point here. Error kernel, everything else can be sacrificed. And most importantly, when I'm developing and testing this app, I should be able to kill off Chaos Monkey style any other parts of my application and the system should tolerate and continue to run. Like our MavMQ example, the zombie rabbit says everything else can go so long as I can receive messages and send them out. Logging is not necessarily uh, a requirement. Metrics are not a requirement. So all of these things within your error kernel should be out of band. They should be sent to a separate process where your little precious data doesn't need to worry about it and can keep running. So, Around this error kernel, the next piece we want to put uh, to paint in the picture is, um, is a state machine. The enemy is the state, um, is the piece we need to preserve. Um, who here is familiar with the term state machine or a, an FSM? So, about, let's say, half to two thirds. So, the general idea of a state machine is I, I don't know why people don't use these more often because conceptually they're very easy to explain and um, in practice. We often implement these things um, implicitly in gen servers or in other, um, other data structures without explicitly doing this. So who's played the game Hopscotch? Not necessarily recently, but as a kid. Yeah, Hopscotch is a grid uh, like this, with a sort of T at the bottom and a T at the top. And you jump onto the first stage of the Hopscotch and you're ready to go. Now you have three choices. You can jump forward. It's a transition. Uh, you can go. You've only got one choice here, so you've got to go forward. That's a transition to a new state. The state is now the second square. Here I have four choices. I can go left to the square, 
right to the square, so that's two transitions. Back, three transitions, arguably not a very useful one, but it still exists. And I can go forward, so four states. And with these little states, with this hopscotch chart, we can develop something that encodes the whole game. So it's very simple. I go forward, I have a state, it changes to a new state. Now, there are two ways of modeling um, FSMs. You can either model the state explicitly, and then a function becomes the thing you call to make the transition. We can model the transition explicitly and have a function that creates the new state. And there's nothing wrong with either of those approaches. For some things, one works better, and for some things, the other one works better. But the key thing is, you can see how this relates to an error kernel. I've got my error kernel. I have transitions that are clearly defined, valid states, but like a, a database schema, and a specific set of functions that allow me to transition to the validated state. Is that pretty straightforward? Glazed eyes in the pre-lunch. The pre-lunch talks a lot. Okay, so what about the invalid transitions? We want to protect our error kernel, and the simple solution here from an Erlang LXA perspective is I have a function that calls, um, that makes a call into the state machine, and I'm going to crash that function because it's sent me garbage, and I'm the error kernel. Everything that it tries to corrupt me must be eliminated. Gone. Okay, and that sounds pretty painful, but if you use something like, uh, it's a good example, gproc is a very common library um, for managing a list of lookups, um, node lookups or process lookups in Erlang. Um, gproc does exactly that. If you try and query for something that doesn't exist, it sends you back, I can't remember exactly what, but it sends you back a, uh, a bad art or something else and your process crashes. You, the person, the, the function or the process that's sending this message, to the state machine, to the error kernel, have to decide what you do. Are you going to trap this failure so that you can return a message to the user? Are you going to put this on a queue or some other system to retry it later? Um, you can't decide that in advance, and that's really the next piece. So I think um, state machines and behaviors, which um, Michael I think is going to talk about later, um, are widely underused in Erlang and Alexia. And what I found in practice is that many of us implement gem servers that do exactly this sort of pattern. We get a message, we match on it, we make some decisions about that, call a function, and up update our state. But the thing with the gen server is, we have made these states explicit, and the gen server framework doesn't require that all of these transitions are valid. Uh, and the cool thing about state machines is you can take them off to the side, you can put them in a, in a proof analyzer, and you can prove that the state machine is valid for the set of transitions you've defined for it which sounds like a super handy thing for an error kernel, doesn't it? Okay, <coughs> so your code should have explicit state mutation functions, setters and getters, or at least loads and loads of pattern matching. And in this error kernel with a state machine around it, you should have types and structs, and it should pass dialyze at every time. Who uses types all the time? I'm expecting to see all your hands up. Who will be using types all the time tomorrow? <laughs> oh, long hands up. Yep, um, you really should. It saves you time. Um, and it catches things you would never have thought. I wasn't a type, um, a type zealot until about two years ago when I was running some code. I started implementing types after the fact, and then I found these errors where I, went, I did not understand my code. I thought it did this, my internal model was wrong. And so types force you, um, they chop off not the entire, uh, they don't chop down the entire forest of, inv of invalid ideas about your code, but they do take out a good few trees that making sure your code works the way you think it does, which unfortunately is not the case most of the time. So, the EVSM of Gen Server should also have some way of keeping it stable in primary, uh, primary storage in the event of the whole VM, the whole VM can be shut down. Everything else you delegate to separate supervisors that when they're restarted, they do not bring down your error kernel state. That's fundamental. That means disk I.O., network I.O., put them all in separate workers. When we want to talk to them, we're going to have to do that through processes or through a more, more, more formal construct like a message queue um, or a rabbit queue or something like that. Um, the only caveat I have for this is that it's really easy to say, let's put everything in its own gene server, everything in separate processes, and everyone will communicate by, uh, by queues. For some parts of your application, this becomes quite inefficient, and that's because of the way um, modern CPUs work. They have a small cache, a slower big cache, and sometimes a third level cache, and then they have RAM and disk. 
and each one of these is maybe an order of magnitude slower. So every time I'm sending a message to another process, um, I'm giving the CPU and the Erlang runtime an opportunity to intervene, dump that cache that I've so carefully created in, in the CPU memory, and go away and do something else. So just be wary if you have too many processes, um, you can end up losing a lot of performance through that. Um, probably for most applications that I write, that's never going to be an issue. Um, the real problem is the speed of the programmer, not the speed of the program. Uh, yeah, so cache lines are important. Um, for critical code, it's really good to have that in a single process uh, that calls functions and needs rather than use message passing everywhere. So, layer two. So we've gone error kernel protected by um, state machine, and now we have people who want to go and get the state machine to change. Change is, change is good, it's not to be feared, it just needs to be managed. And so you put this change in a queue. It doesn't necessarily have to be a queue, it could be a database, it could be a uh, file, it could be some sort of structured storage, but we can broadly think of it as a queue. Um, it's a series of transactions or um, requests for this particular state machine to try to apply. We're not guaranteeing success, um, and we also need to think about what happens with um, the modes of failure. So I call these uh, predictable modes of failure, there at the bottom. So the predictable mode of failure is the, the key learning for me that I talk out of developing ODP applications is it's okay to fail, I'm just going to make deliberate choices about where it happens and what the consequences of that are. So in the RabbitMQ example, um, I'm assuming that they thought of this and it wasn't just a coincidence that it works, um, someone has said, I don't really care about logging, um, that's a secondary thing. So someone has said, I'm going to put logging messages into a separate process. Um, I'm going to send the log messages. So in, uh, on the beam, the sending message always succeeds. There's never an error code back from that, even if the process no longer exists, or it's on another node that's disappeared. So from the, um, the happy path, the code we're writing, log this, log this, just keep going. Metric this, metric this, just keep going. These messages are going to another process. They can make decisions about batching them, uh, maybe queuing them if the um, system at the other end is no longer there. Um, it might go to handle temporary network outages, like um, if you're using something like rsyslog for system logging, you can ask it to cache on disk until the network connection to the other server comes back so you don't lose stuff. All of these things are the things we can think about um, when we're implementing queues. In particular, we need to monitor for throughput and latency. Uh, I think the size of the queue is indirectly important because if you run out of memory, then, then you're hosed. But generally, throughput and latency are the things that operation you tend to notice. If your throughput drops, if the latency gets too high, users will start to notice. And they're easy things to check for. Um, you can log length, um, like message queue length. Um, I think in earlier Erlang releases, um, it was an ON operation, and I think now it's O1. Um, I can't remember when that changed, but it's a good change. So now querying the message queue length of a process is not something that gets worse as your system gets more available. Uh, that's great. Um, so, the queue's built up, and we don't really know why, and we have to make a choice about what we do. Are we going to keep adding to the queue and risk that the VM will eventually crash? Um, and we have three choices. We can defer, dump, or delegate. In fact, I took these terms from managing people. When someone's got too much work, you sit them down and go, you've got three choices. To further work, you're just not going to do it, you're going to dump it, um, you're never going to do it, or you can delegate, you can find an employee or a contractor or whatever to do that work for you. You can have back pressure. Yes, yeah, so back pressure is part of that. So in my mind, deferring is exactly back pressure. Um, yep, and you can wait for that other thing to be empty of it. Um, there are some really, really cool libraries that have come out um, for the last two or three years to do this. <coughs> Postbox, which I think is from um, Fedeber. Um, fuse and safety valve um, from JOE, and I'm sure there are others now. Um, yeah, so the key point here is we're also shipping metrics off to other systems. Um, for this important queue of transactions waiting to be applied to our state machine, we also want to report on outliers, and the magic number I found is the 95th percentile outlier. Um, this is the, if you like, you've got some sort of graph. This stuff is good in the middle, we're doing lots of it. There's things that are very quick down the front here, and there's stuff down the back, the long tail, which is getting worse and worse and worse and worse. This 95th percentile typically is the thing where your users start to see problems. So if you've got to graph one thing from your systems, 
for these views, I would put the 95th percentile and then graph it on some little chart. And sure enough, when people start having problems, you will see this percentile start to rise. And that's when you get a monitoring threshold that says below this, this is a reasonable point. I'm going to have to go and investigate. So, we've deferred, we've dumped, we've delegated. The general point, the way I think about queues, it's, a, it's an explicit coordination point between other parts of our system. And I'll cover that on the next slide, but the guts of it is, um, prior to this point, our supervisor tree has been very, very straightforward. I've got a state machine um, wrapping the error kernel, and that's my primary function in this, this entire application. I have a larger supervisor tree with auxiliary functions that are important and they'll get crashed and restarted um, more or less transparently. At some point, I'm going to have to take a, a design step here and make an explicit choice about whether a particular piece of code, um, it's a, a library module or an application, is part of my main supervisor tree or it's part of some ad hoc function that I just want to be aware of. Uh, and we'll look at an example, a specific example, um, a few slides further on. Um, so, in terms of predictable modes of failure, we're sending these messages to our FSM, it's, it's to our state machine, it's going to decide whether or not to apply these, and the outcome is either applied, success, continue, or rejected. And the way I recommend for your, your error kernel is to send back some sort of bad art type message. Something that will crash the caller. The caller has then a choice. They can do a try catch and recover, which in our case means you've made a conscious choice, predictable mode of failure for this type of error message or this type of message on what to do. You have to view the program and have to know what you want to do about this. Are you going to stick it back on a queue and retry it later? Are you going to send a message back to the user? I don't know. Um, Joe Armstrong has mentioned this several times and as part of his discussion about the happy path and he says what tends to happen is programs get given a spec and we implement the spec and then there's this undefined behaviour so we implement that I, I think of this as the C language, this is the definition, the, you know, the, the canonical definition of the undefined specification um, what you should do according to Joe Armstrong which is therefore gospel yeah, is that you don't implement that undefined behaviour, you simply don't you let it crash, it will fall over, and then the rest of the world has to go back and figure out what they wanted this program and this program to do in that case. Let it crash, let it bubble up. Um, it sounds scary, but in practice it works surprisingly well. You start off, things die, you pick them up, and then you sit down with your, maybe your design team or, or um, um, business people and work out what you really want to happen. 99% of the time, this is a very good strategy. You're dumping the stuff you don't know about, and the rest of your application, the valid stuff, continues to work. Right. Unfortunately, it sounds all very straightforward at this stage. Um, we've got queues looking after our transactions coming in, and we know what to do when there's stuff in the queue that's right. We know how to handle um, uh, things that uh, going through that are valid, and we know we have to make a conscious decision about how to handle things that are not valid. Unfortunately, the layer 3 is the ugly real world. We have things like um, networks that are flaky. When you start a TCP session, some of the data comes eventually, and then it comes to the flood, and then and it stops. It's gone. At least you think it's gone, but it turns out the other end had a bit of a slow spot, and it's just setting it still. Um, in this space of time, you might have closed out a network socket and um, started a new one. And the new one, depending on how you set it up, may get the tail end of the last transaction from the server that still thinks the socket is open. Uh, that's actually quite common if you're using SO um, reuse. So we have unlimited, unanticipated modes of failure. There are so many things going wrong, we can't possibly um, consider them all. And for me, this was the enlightening thing about learning early. Was it's okay not to be a programmer who doesn't understand everything, who doesn't, un who doesn't handle all the corner cases. Because if you focus on the happy path, 90% of the business is working, 90% of your users are happy, and you're accumulating this pile of garbage where you can work down later and, and, and in a less stressful time, not real time debugging because your application is crashing. No, you've got a log file or a stash of things that don't look right, and you can go back and work them out. 90% of the rest of the business is going on. 
So no programmer, no matter how smart, not even cryptographers get this right 100% of the time. I think of this as embracing your inner demons, accepting that failure is inevitable, and making it explicit. So this is the, if you like, the tower of the beam, the way of the beam, is what will fail and what will propagate from that failure. So this is where we need to think carefully about making our failure modes explicit here. It could be the work of failing, um, it could be failure to validate input, it could be some world failures, so networking in particular is a great example of this, or disks, and the timing matters. The rabbit and cube example, the zombie rabbit, the underlying issue was that if messages were coming through fast enough, the invalid messages that the logger is trying to, to, try to send batch up sufficiently fast, the batch is full, it tries to send, it has nowhere to send it, it crashes, a new worker is spawned, it crashes, a new worker is spawned, it crashes, a new worker is spawned, it crashes so fast that the supervisor has exceeded its, um, its uh, allowable retry within a given amount of time. So the supervisor then terminates. So if the throughput was fast enough, we kill off the workers, we kill off the supervisors, the supervisor dies, and then the entire subsection of Rapid MQ underneath it restarts cleanly from a no good state, and the system re resumes again. So the key thing here is when you're talking to the real world, you have to think explicitly about overload, about queue overload, about um, throughput in the system, and there's no hard and fast rules for this, but my general rule of thumb is monitor and measure everything related to a queue, latency, throughput, um, message queue length if you can, graph them over time, and then make some long-term decisions about what the sensible thing to do is. Um, dropping queues, queue data sounds painful, but in most cases, you're dropping transactions that are not related to your error kernel, and they will somewhere be recovered, um, somewhere. Maybe your users will be grumpy, but maybe most of them, 90% of them, will still have a working system, and that's probably better than no one working at all. So, one of the things you can have, I'll touch on this um, near the end if we have time, is a, a, a really common pattern for high throughput billing applications, um, is to initialize a shared socket, or maybe a database handle, or a UDP board, something like that, um, in the supervisor or in the first worker if you're having a RESTful 1 um, supervisor and then passing that through to all subsequent workers. So they share the socket and any one of them that is ready um, will be able to take the next message off the socket. So one socket and maybe 20 or 50 workers handling it. The problem here is what happens when one of these um, connections times out, the socket dies for some reason. Um, in this model we need to restart all the workers all at once and it's very easy for us to exceed our retry limit. It's something very easy to test. You can start an observer and go off and kill um, either the supervisor or, the, or the, um, the first process, the first worker process repeatedly and see what happens with your rather than script to do it. But it's kind of nice to kill them off and kill them off and watch your system keep running. Uh, it's a really nice demo. Yep. Um, so when we have these workers, we need to have, we have a choice of three things. We need to link to them or monitor or explicitly supervise. The difference between these three is explicit supervision puts in a supervision tree and as a result of that we are now um, at risk of cascading failure. The other choice is to have them under um, separate supervisors. Um, let's try and find a good example here. Um, if I'm handing a web server I have two main pieces. I have a whole lot of concurrent requests happening and I have some back-end processing to decide what to send people. So I can either arrange these with all of the um, HTTP um, listeners under one supervisor, and then over here, over here another big pile of um, workers where I'm simply um, handling backend transactions. The backend transactions might fall over periodically, the workers might fall over periodically, and supervisors will restart them. The other way of doing this is to turn them around so it makes more sense to have a single um, HTTP listener with its own um, potentially supervised process, or maybe in process, its own connection to the database or to the, to the back end to decide what to do. That's more efficient from a cache perspective, um, and it changes the way our supervision tree looks. If I have a problem in a particular back end worker now, it's going to crash, it's going to be restarted, but it's directly linked to the supervision tree now to its corresponding HTTP listener. So the two choices here is structure around um, the flow of work through the system, make that supervision tree explicit, web listener, web backend, or structure it in a group where you have all the things that are common together. And the first time I did my own um, OTP project, 
I put all the things that are similar over here, and all the other things that are different over here, so web listeners and web workers over here. And partway through, I switched them around, and it made things much cleaner. When one of my workers died, um, I lost the corresponding server process, and that was all good. Things restarted the next connection. You have that choice. <coughs> hmm? Ten minutes. Okay, cool. So we need to trust nothing and we need to verify all the data coming at the border. This is the only place in our application we should do this, in our layer 3. And after this, from tomorrow on, you will be using dialyzer, structs, records and maps uh, throughout your system from here on. So once we've been through this, uh, this code, we end up with uh, four types of things that are left. The OK, the heavy path, the code that fills out your workers and gen, gen things, pretty straightforward. Help applications or maybe full libraries dealing with third party APIs and supporting stuff that's just helpers. It doesn't need to be, uh, doesn't need to have its own state and so it does need to be a full um, OTP application. And then we need to go through and fill out the gaps with links and monitors from across our supervision tree to provide the mesh of error control to link up things that we've made a conscious choice not to group together. So if we've got web workers here and HTTP listeners here, we need to link them across. If we've done it the other way around, connection and as peer worker, um, then maybe we need to link that to a supervision tree to restart the web workers um, or the listeners as, as they fall over. So we made the handling explicit in our workers and supervision trees, and in, in my experience, compared to other programming languages, other contemporary languages, we simply have the need to rewrite most of the um, error checking code. And what we have done, what I like to think we should be doing, is We've taken this area handling logic and put it into a supervision tree. It would kind of be cool if you could see that graphically when you're programming, um, but we have to do it manually with text files. It's worth drawing that out and making sure that your linking and so forth makes sense under these predictable modes of failure. So this is a little concrete example. You won't really be able to read um, pictures, but you'll notice there's a little blue uh, icon at the top there, just by coincidence. So this is a library called um, uh, it's GIF uh, by DeadZen, and it's a neat design pattern, first documented by Steve Lossky. It's an ODP application to manage an EATS table in a reliable way with, uh, with recovery support. So, in the context of this talk, we think about this EATS table as our error kernel, but it could be any pool resource. It could be um, sockets or database connections, web servers or port drivers, anything like that that we want to manage as a resource and at the same time attach some sort of queue or workflow to. The general idea is that a next table is created and the working on that process is delegated to a monitored uh, worker, which is this uh, app. It spawns a supervisor with one for one or next for one. Here's our supervisor. The first thing it does is it spawns a table manager. And the table manager, like the typical manager, only really does two things. It ensures there's people working and then it goes home. That's it. It spawns a table worker. The manager then creates a table and the manager also monitors the worker. The worker says, here's the table, and now we're over here at the worker. We've got a table, and unfortunately the worker suffers some form of arcane death, which is quite common early. The manager received an, an exit notification because we've set up a monitor up here, and the manager then spawns a replacement table worker. Uh, the manager then monitors the worker and sends a message again to the worker, just like it did before, here's a table, and the worker starts working. Same thing again. The key thing here is what's, what I couldn't put on a single slide is that if for some reason this manager dies, which is quite unlikely because if all it's doing is spawning a worker and then waiting until the worker dies to spawn another one, XGIV allows us to receive a message back to the supervisor, which then so here, which then receives back the ownership of the X table or the socket or whatever it is you want to keep hold of, and it can restart the whole process again. So the work and the management of that work ensuring these people working on it is completely separate here and really that's the sort of pattern we're looking for in our OTP libraries here. This clear separation of control all the way through. Um, it is almost inconceivable that this main application here will ever actually die. All it's doing every time is it has an ETS table, it's starting up a manager supervisor process and passing that through to it. That's pretty straightforward, it's pretty reliable code. And then the rest of the system, elsewhere we've got cubes um, interacting with that worker, sending stuff through. It's separate, it's safe, that's our uh, Did that make sense? Did it bring back the last 10 minutes into a single picture? Yeah. 
It's a great library. I highly recommend you go to have a look. It's short. It's sweet. It's um, really nice LA code to read. So um, we've got about oh, five minutes left or something. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Beam Ops, um, all using open source tools. Um, operational Beam code for me is a dream to deploy. There's no, depend no dependencies and the self-contained releases make for really, really easy packaging. However, it's awkward to get things like runtime sockets and logging and pairing the usual places for sysadmin. So it's great that it's dependency free, um, but it's anti-Unix. And I really wish the OTP team would fix that. Um, there are third-party um, modules you can use to plug in to do that, but it's nothing like um, being able to send a signal handler directly to your early release, uh, your early runtime, and have it really its config files or whatever you want it to do. Um, there's a big gap in here. Regarding logging, um, Lager and Xlogger are well known, um, but under very high load, um, they also exhibit some, some problems. There's a, another one called Syslog app, it's very, very fast, which is great. Um, it also uses NIFs, and I hope with the new Unix socket support in OTP19, we can have the best of both worlds. High speed logging with zero NIF dependencies. Um, distributed log for, for the win. Um, for monitoring, you need to have both. Um, you need to have white box. So white box is the code you write as a developer. It's the bit which goes, oh yeah, we did a thing. Let's send an event that says thing completed. Um, or we send another event saying it took two seconds to, to process this thing. That's white box. You need to know the inside of your application and you need to monitor it. No one can do that for you. It's got to come out of your code and your business. You also need to monitor what I think the black box. It's look from outside the OS, which we talked about earlier, uh, the network, and um, we can also look at things uh, like the amount of memory used by the VM in certain, in certain forms, how much is being used by ports, how much is being used by um, atoms, which should change over time, and um, yep, binaries, um, ends, and so forth. So, quick question who here has used live debugging? One, I want to see hands up if you have. Okay, tomorrow, after you've started embedding types, um, I want you to go and have a look at um, one of two tools, either Recon or DBG, depending on whether you're an Elixir or an Erlang person. There is nothing like it. If you are using Erlang or Elixir in production and you have not used Recon, for shame, for shame, yep, <laughs> spend a week on it. There's nothing like it. Um, what we normally do as programmers and developers is we write stuff, we ship it, it doesn't work. <coughs> we add some logging, i.e. print statements, we ship it, it doesn't work, and because we've got so many print statements and the behavior of the program has changed, and the problem that we were originally looking for has gone. So we leave the print statements in there, um, because, yeah, problem solved, on we go. And what we really want to do is we want to be able to see in real time how these things are working. So, pictures are great. This is black box metrics, um, with the usual sort of stuff. Um, there's a couple of general interesting things here. System load, memory, um, a little bit about rabbit and queue. Basically, any time we're getting a backlog of unacknowledged messages, we have a problem, we should do something about it. Um, uptime is a box we booted recently, disk space. And up the top here, because we've got a distributed system, we're actually checking here tunnels. Do we have connectivity from node A to node B and sort of a mesh? And you can see we've got a boutique um, scale here because we can fit all the boxes um, in a single line. The actual line is about there. But you get the picture, if you had a thousand systems, you simply couldn't do that. Um, this is really expensive to do if you use hosting cloud providers, Datadog, uh, New Relic. Um, in fact, it was so expensive, it was more than three times our entire hosting costs. So we stopped doing it, and this tool is um, a combination of uh, Collect D for infrastructure measurement, Remin for live streaming metrics to the browser. These things update in real time at the cost of laptop CPU, they get really hot while doing this, um, and then we ship it out to Graphite. Why Graphite? Because we have boutique scale, um, we don't have problems with throughput or disk space or anything like that. Um, we use ZFS, we can store seven years worth of data at 10 second resolution um, forever. It's great, yeah. Um, if you have a thousand servers, that won't be possible. So, white ops metrics, supervisor and worker restarts, internal VM metrics, um, memory allocation, run queue, so the run queue is um, originally was a metric when we had a single um, runtime um, 
It was how many tasks are outstanding to do. And when we have multiple schedulers within a single VM, I'm not really sure exactly what it means. Although if it's getting higher, there's a problem. Okay? Um, an error log and message queue length. I've personally been bitten by a system crashing because the rate of logging of errors had increased so high, so much, that the error log itself became the problem crash the VMs. It consumes memory. Um, it's really painful. It's really worth monitoring that specifically. So, random queue, it's a close look on that piece of the graph. You can see down here the one that really matters for us is um, total messages unacknowledged. That's basically the main line. If that starts to backlog, we've, we've got a problem. And here we're looking inside the VM. So, ports, processes over here, um, error logger, um, and run queue down here. That's the main thing. And again here, this is memory usage. We're expecting to see that pretty constant over time. The first time you shift the new app into production, this is really the key thing to watch, this sort of, this sort of basic VM metrics. Give yourself uh, a couple of minutes every day just to keep an eye on it and see if it's not growing. Other than that, you can pretty much ignore it. So, time to stop, yeah. If you're holding a lunch. Yeah, that's right, that's really serious. So, <coughs> regarding live debugging, um, Read the stack trace and tell us what's wrong. Get used to it, it's not that hard. Specifically gives the function names and a hierarchy of what they're called. And those are the pieces you need to go to to, to look through. Use recon trace, recon trace to um, see what's happening in runtime. You can specifically look into your code and say for this function and this module and these parameters, show me the stack trace, show me its return code, um, show me you called it. So instead of inserting random print statements and recompiling your code for everything, you can just extract a single message from this particular IP address that's causing a problem uh, in real time without recompiling. It's a dream. <coughs> so, we have some other stuff that I didn't get to. Um, let's just go through the nice picture again. Yeah, that's cool. Um, thanks for listening. I hope that was useful. Um, remember to tweet. There's a, a white. There's a white. Yeah. There's a white. Uh, a white uh, a white in there. And um, if you need a domain name, uh, come and try us. We accept transfers as well. Okay, thank you. <coughs>